Cool. Is it time? I think it's time. <laughs> oh. Do we start now? Do you want a countdown? <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> I would like fireworks. <laughs> and um, hello. Hi. Hi, Fabi. Hi, Corin. <laughs> Corinne Tucker and I first met in 2011, when she was on the cover of the first issue of She Shreds magazine. Being in punk bands and touring up and down the Pacific Northwest throughout my late teens and early 20s, I feel like I just sort of knew Corinne Tucker as an icon. Of course, I was already a fan of Heavens to Betsy and Slater Kinney, but I really got to know her when I joined the band on their 2021 tour as a third guitarist. Corin isn't only an incredible guitarist, singer, and songwriter. She is a wealth of knowledge, hilarious, and full of incredible stories, so I was really excited to talk with her for starting a riot. You've heard snippets of that conversation throughout the podcast, but figured you might like to hear more. We sat down with our guitars in case a little riff inspiration came through, and I started from the beginning. What was it like when she and her friend Tracy Sawyer first started Heavens to Betsy in their hometown of Eugene, Oregon? Well, I think that, you know, Tracy and I were friends in high school and we had always had this like fantasy about being a band. And in fact, this is crazy, but (laughs) the summer before high school, we went to Athens, Georgia. We took the train across the country. We went to Athens, Georgia, and it was basically like a research project of like, another scene that I wanted to understand, like how bands worked there and how, how people did that life, you know? And we went there, Tracy was like probably 16. I was 17. It was insane when I look back. We went there, got an apartment, lived there, met everyone we could, um, going to shows that were like underage. We bought a drum kit in Athens (laughs) that Tracy still owns today and we put it on the train and we took it home and we're like yeah we're gonna we're gonna have a band someday so I mean it was like in a way it felt like a pipe dream but because Olympia was so plugged into that idea of like how do we um you know how do we change music, you know, to revolutionize it was kind of like how the Olympia speak was. They wanted to have inclusivity. They wanted to have amateurs was like really exciting to like the kind of music scene there, you know, Mm -hmm. because it was very anti corporate music industry. Mm -hmm. And so for us to be like, yeah, we're a band, you know, and then to get that show (laughs) in front of like Beat Happening and Fugazi and all these people that I admired, Mecca Normal, you know to play that, it was, that was like, um, yeah, it was like actually making it a reality. How did you get the motivation to just go and do things? Like you just went to Athens, you just decided to have a band, you just decided to buy a drum kit. What inspired that? I mean, I think it's a lot of things. I mean, I think that it was a lot of encouragement and like, you know, a lot of privilege that I I was able to be from a family that like fully supported me. My dad like gave me a guitar and mm. bought me a, an amp, a used amp. But still, mm-hmm. you know, like I think when I look back, that's that's so critical. And I also was just always a really stubborn human being, you know, because I just I felt like I never like fit into the kind of stereotypical pretty girl or whatever in high school like that just wasn't me and I desperately wanted to do something that was meaningful and different and also let me tell my own story um and I saw it like I literally saw it that night on stage with those women doing it and I was like I want to do that you know Mm -hmm. and I don't I mean I don't know how you feel that unless you're young. I look back and I'm like, well, that's just, I was just a kid, you know, and, and I was lucky enough to be, to have people be like, okay, yeah, you know, let's, let's make that happen. So I want to get a clear painting of what was happening in Olympia when you set foot there to be, to, to be in, at Evergreen College, you know, what, 
what was the, what did it sound like? What were the conversations about? And how did you feel as someone who was already sort of tapped in, but not fully immersed? So what did fully being fully immersed in that culture, how did that then influence what Heavens to Betsy became for the rest of the duration of the band? I think I was really welcomed into that scene. Like I started going to every single show at the North Shore Surf Club in in Olympia. It was just, I was just like very lucky because, you know, right away, I happens to Betsy put out a single with Bratmobile, like a split seven inch on K. Um, you know, Kevin was like, well, let's make this happen. And Molly Newman recorded us in at Evergreen, like we recorded a few songs. So, I mean, we couldn't have been in a more like supportive scene where people were like, yeah, let's just, let's just make this happen. You know, mm-hmm. I think sonically it was, you know, it was like very simplistic, um, I still like writing that way. Mm. I still feel like that's sort of my core writing Mm. abilities, you know, like, let me just, uh, like if I think about, this is a song that's, it's called My Red Self. What is the color? Like that's one of the first songs I wrote and it's really, really simple, but I still feel like that's kind of how I relate to, to putting music together. Mm. It's like, I don't like clutter in songwriting. Mm-hmm. 100%. <laughs> okay. I'm going to like go back a little bit just to understand again, the timeline. Um, and you're, you've been in Olympia now for a few years. How does your voice change? How does your connection to being on stage and holding a guitar and your whole confidence with that evolve? And, you know, what what do you notice um, is changing sonically in the way that you play? I think I've played more shows with other bands and there are only two of us and I was to Betsy, Mm -hmm. right? Just one guitar and one drummer. And I think we wanted to be, um, we wanted to take up more space sonically. And so it's definitely on the like full length record that we did with Kill Rock Stars. I tried to like branch out, you know, and like, there's like a song called Axeman on there that, let's see if I can remember it. Here we go, Axeman, here we go. At the pep rally, stole the show, wearing a purple and a white. Look around, cause there's so much white. And then I switched to the the chorus, and it's like full on power chords at this point. It's like I'm out of my head, I'm out of my life, I'm out of my mind tonight. So it just took that kind of simplistic songwriting and it added the bar chord, <laughs> which is like still what I do today, to be totally. honest. <laughs> I'm just like a bar chord fiend. Like that's a really, cause I'm singing the whole time. Like it's yeah. really about mm-hmm. my voice when mm-hmm. I songwrite mm-hmm. and it's really about trying to tell this story. Um, mm-hmm. I added the bar chord. I added like getting louder on the chorus, mm-hmm. you know, and that was kind of like that, that whole period of Habits to Betsy was, yeah, the kind of like louder, almost getting to the point of grunge rock at that Mm -hmm. point, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was just like a louder amp, a couple more pedals, that kind of thing. You were just like, how do I get louder and louder and louder (laughs) without adding more band members? Basically. (laughs) And also my voice got louder too, because as the guitar got louder, Mm -hmm. my voice had to keep up. And I had to get above. I mean, the, when we played shows, there was no sound system half the time. There was like, wow. you know, 
if we if there was an actual PA, that was like a really big deal. But but it could barely carry my voice. So I learned to like get you know to really sing over that kind of mm. loud guitar, and mm-hmm. so my voice definitely got louder, right, 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 and more insistent in how it's about to be. That's yeah, definitely. That's amazing. Um, okay, so the tuning, the tuning also has a big. It just complements your voice really nicely. Um, so when did that start? So in heaven, to Betsy, I mean, first of all, let me just be clear that I, I never really learned how to traditionally play guitar. You know, perfect. Like I was just like, no. I was Me so either. stubborn. That's not true. <laughs> You're like fully classically trained. I, but like that was, I was like, I feel like nothing. Does it really, when you're 14 and you're classically trained and then you're 19 and you're playing punk music. I don't know. They're so different from each other. True. You but know? like, I honestly don't know all okay. those traditional chords. Amazing. And so I just tuned the guitar. And Heaven's to Betsy, I literally tuned it to my voice in a way that I thought was like, I never even used a chromatic tuner in Heaven's to Betsy. I just, mm. you know, my dad taught me how to tune it by ear and I just did it that way. And when we, when I started playing music with Carrie for Slater Kinney, mm-hmm. we had to like figure it out because she was like, what, how do I, what is going on with your guitar? And I was like, let's tune down. Cause that's cool. Right. Cause that's what like Sonic Youth does, Nirvana. Like it was all about those bands had that alternate tuning. You know, Mm -hmm. it was like they were the guitar gods that like would go like, you know, and like tune to some interesting tuning. And I was like, well, let's tune down because that's very metal. Mm -hmm. And and we tuned down a step and a half to C sharp, but a standard tuning. So it's really not that different Mm -hmm. at all, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And we just stayed there. We were like, oh, that's different. It made our songs different. You know, when we started writing music, even the first record, it was like, oh, well, it's it sounds different than other bands because it is this weird tuning. And so we just have stuck with it for like 30 years. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. I mean, it makes your sound so uniquely you. Mm-hmm. I want to move into when Slater Kinney began and... um how you and Carrie met in the first place. How did y'all meet? What was happening at the time? I was playing a show with Heavens to Betsy and I played the show and then was in an argument with like six guys. (laughs) This was like, it was at the show off gallery in Bellingham, Washington. And after I like kind of finished arguing with those guys about being a sexist, um, Carrie walked up to me and um, she was like, um, hello, I would like some more information about Riot Girl. And <laughs> That's so good. And I was like, okay, um, yeah, you give me your address. And I, I took down her address in my lyric book and um, never wrote her back. But we had this conversation where she was like, yeah, I'm going to Western and I'm, I'm, I'm going to drop out because I, I, I can't stand it. I want to move to Olympia. And I was like, you should move to Olympia. You absolutely should do it. And she did. <laughs> wow. And we um yeah, we started hanging out in Olympia and she was in a different band, right? So she was in XQ17 and I was in Heavens to Betsy. And um so our bands would like play together and go on tour together and I just was like she is a smoking guitar player. Mm. She was really different than I mean, I am like very like rhythm guitar player, basically. Like I, I write melodies, but they're basically, it's almost like a bass player, how I play guitar. Mm. And she was the opposite. She's very like notey and riffs and all this cool stuff. And I was like, mm, I wonder if we could play together, you know? And we did. And it was, I just got this like zzzt. It was this really two really different players playing together, and I was like, "This is, this is cool. Let's record this. We'll, we'll, let's make a song," mm-hmm. and it just started happening. Um, <laughs> despite our other bands, which we eventually, you know, b- like broke up with and started Slater Kinney. So we went to Australia. <laughs> My favorite story is we were like, I was like, we should go to Australia because that makes sense to write a record in a foreign country. 
<laughs> and we did. <laughs> Amazing. Scorpio. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and I'm curious if you can think of like three songs that can sort of define your evolution from beginning, like when you first started as Slater Kinney to when you were the most active and playing shows and touring and love, all the things to now. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's funny. I think, well, I mean, I think of like, so very early days, mm -hmm. I would say there is a song from our first record called Be Your Mama, mm -hmm. where Carrie is playing this riff that's like, -na 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 and I literally remember running, we were staying at Laura's house in Melbourne and I heard her, I was like in the other room, I heard her playing that riff and I was like, keep playing that. And I started, you know, she was like, -na 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 -na, and I joined in on guitar and I could play. I just brought those bar chords in and it, I was suddenly like, just suddenly was like a rock song, you know, and, and it was just like this big sound. It was big. And we played wow. this show. We played this show in Adelaide over, I swear to God, like a bar, like a saloon. And we borrowed this metal band's equipment to play the show. And we suddenly had like huge amps, like giant stacked amps. And we played that song and it just, the room went, like everyone was dancing. Everyone was freaking out. And I was like, this is it. Like it was literally that moment where I felt like it, we were like greater than the sum of who we are, like with writers, like because of like the different abilities that we had, we were able to make this song that was like mm. big and like sounded like a, a rock song, you know? Wow. Amazing. What were the chords? Um, what was, what were they? Um, <laughs> so it goes. <laughs> It's very wow. like, I mean, you can hear the bikini kill on that song. You know, totally. it was like. I mean, it's full energy. It's full it energy. It's full energy. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's so awesome. But it went from like this combination of, yeah, of like full rock. And then I'm trying to think of like what other songs would be kind of like more, you know, tell you about like different eras of Slater Kinney. Um, I think. I Want to Be Your Joey Ramone is like a really big song for us, mm -hmm. you know? Because mm -hmm. we always also like played with all those archetypes of totally. different rockers. So this is like a more melodic kind of picking song. Mm -hmm. It's by Yayan When it's all mine It's on my wall It's in my kind of I'm singing Carrie's part on that mm, on that verse but got it, got it. yeah it was it was kind of adding in a little bit of like the melodic kind of like mm -hmm. note thing mm -hmm. that I think we really liked doing mm -hmm. um just a little bit of that before it got to the chorus um we loved bands like television mm. you know all those New York bands New York Dolls and and all those really notey um, Gang of Four, mm -hmm. like all those 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 awesome like guitar noty bands, and I think as we kind of went along in the the evolution of songwriting, we tried to like add some of that in mm -hmm. into what we were doing. And I think of a song like No Cities, where um, 
we do kind of like add that that stuff in, which mm-hmm. and I'll play you the the, mm-hmm. the main thing. So that's like the kind of base, basically the bass line totally. that I play through the whole song. Mm-hmm. But I love it. It's very like melodic and rhythmic and it's you know I think it's just taking my sort of rhythm songwriting and just you know kind of like stepping Mm -hmm. up in terms of making a little more complicated and Mm -hmm. going underneath like Carrie singing yeah um yeah but I think you know I think like just kind of like giving yourself a little bit more space Mm. in terms of like the songwriting as we kind of went along in years and and try different things. Um, mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. we just try to kind of add some of that that those different flavors of bands that we liked over the years. Right. It sounds like being immersed in that really special moment of the beginning of Rag Girl and the energy that opened so many doors for mm-hmm. so much exploration of culture. And of politics and being able to feel confident in a way that maybe many hadn't before. Mm -hmm. Um, And the explosion of experimentation Mm -hmm. that was able to come afterwards, maybe, you know. And and I think to sort of wrap up the conversation, I I know that you have kids now, you know, who are experimenting in their own in their own cultures. Mm -hmm. Um, So what do you, what are you seeing? What are you excited about? What the doors that Riot Girl and the doors that Slater Kinney um, post Riot Girl opened up for people today? Conversations, sounds, Mm -hmm. um, ways of being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, um, I think... It's, I think there's so many more doors that are open now for musicians, you know. Um, I think, you know, thinking about what my kids are into and the music that they listen to, there are just so many different artists that they go and see. And it's just, it's not that big a deal to see a female artist now, you know, who's like completely in control or a trans artist. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I took my daughter and her friend to see cave town at crystal ballroom and it was off the hook. It was so (laughs) off the hook. It was like, (laughs) it was like a trans explosion. It was amazing. Wow. It was like every trans kid in Portland was there to see that show. And it was so great. It was like, you know what? It just, it was like full open arms acceptance. And that's just, that is to me like, that's the power of music is, is like, you know, let's, Mm -hmm. let's like just open that door. And it is, it is a connecting thing. I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but it does connect people Mm -hmm. from different walks of life, Mm -hmm. you know, in a way that you don't expect. Right. And I guess also, let me not put words in your mouth. Like, is it, do you feel that correlation between Riot Girl as a movement and that change and access happening today? I mean, I think it's one of many, one of Mm -hmm. many movements, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there was ACT UP, right? Mm -hmm. That was like the huge influence I think on Riot Girl was Mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. you know, the kind of like really fierce gay activism that happened around AIDS in this country. There's, you know, civil rights movements or Black Lives Matter, you know, I mean, there's so many different movements that just demand for the culture to change. Mm. I think they all, you know, kind of bounce off one another. Mm. And, you know, I can see their effect on like sort of the next generation, like my kids' generation and how they are in the world is different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. Is there anything else that you want to say about just your sound and any of your experiences or anything that you feel like, hasn't been mentioned as far as Riot Girl's contribution, you you and your community's contribution to um, women having more access to performing. 
Yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm excited there are, there are more women performing. I think there's just like still farther to go in terms of mm-hmm. like, you know, women doing kind of like all aspects of the music business mm-hmm. and, and, and having those percentages up in terms of like producers, running your record label, you know, doing the business stuff. Like, I think that's, I think that's changing now, but I just, you know, I think that, um, that it's, it's good to see, uh, that, you know, just more women being included in like every aspect of music. Totally. Yeah. Right. And also like personally, playing with y'all and and being able to see more of the back end too and like the guitar tech world and all of that you know it's really interesting yeah the huge gap that you see from the performers and the artists and the visibility there and we think that we're going and we're moving forward in a big way and then on the back end it's like whoa where are the people Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. where does that visibility connect to back here and I and I really appreciate you know the intention by Slater, Slater Kinney and making sure that that visibility is on all aspects. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, agreed. Mm-hmm. Nice. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Starting a Riot is brought to you by Oregon Public Broadcasting and She Shreds Media. Thanks to all the members who make podcasts possible at OPB. This podcast is hosted by me, Fabi Reina. Julie Sabatier produced this podcast, and I'm going to hand the first part of these credits over to her. The songs you heard in this episode were My Red Self and Axeman by Heavens to Betsy. Thank you to the band members and to Terror Bird and Kill Rockstars for allowing us to use those songs. You can find a playlist on our website, opb.org slash starting a riot. Our theme music is composed by Ray Ags. Listen to their solo projects and their bands, Trash Kit, Shopping, and Sacred Paws. Our editor for this project is Sage Van Wing. Our sound engineers are Nalene Silva and Stephen Cray. All mixing and mastering by Stephen Cray. Thanks to JT Griffith and the team at Liminal Music for help with music rights. And special thanks to Nathan Fossold and Black Book Guitars for loaning us two amps for the interview with Corn Tucker. And thanks to Polaris Hall for hosting that interview. The other songs you heard in this episode were Be Your Mama, I Want to Be Your Joey Ramone, and No Cities to Love by Slater Kinney. If you like our podcast, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review. It helps people find us. 